Please welcome to the stage University of Missouri School of Law ACS Chapter Leader President and ACS Student Next Generation Leader, Hirsch Joshi. Good afternoon, my name is Hirsch Joshi and I am currently the president of the ACS chapter at the University of Missouri School of Law. It's been a privilege to work alongside my fellow executive board members and an honor to be named the 2022 student chapter of the year. Often when I tell people, sure. Thank you. Often when I tell people I go to Mizzou Law, I get questions about a certain former professor who now serves in the US Senate. He's perhaps most famous for being an early proponent of the big lie and raising an approving fist to insurrectionists on January 6th. But it's the following day I wanna talk about. It was January 7th when President Biden nominated Vanita Gupta to be the Associate Attorney General of the United States. Her nomination and subsequent confirmation are only the most recent steps in a career that has been defined to, by a commitment to creating paths for marginalized and disenfranchised communities to empower themselves. There's a reason why an internet search of Vanita Gupta turns up so many results, including, and I quote here, civil rights badass. <laughs> Frankly, any brief introduction can't really do Associate Attorney General Gupta justice, but I can try my best. After graduating from NYU Law School, Gupta began working for the NAACP's Legal Defense and Educational Fund. In 2007, she began working for the ACLU as a staff attorney and eventually rose to be director for the Center for Justice, working to reform our criminal legal system and end mass incarceration. In 2014, President Obama tapped her to be acting assistant attorney general and head of the department's Depar Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. During her leadership and relevant to Missouri, then Assistant Attorney General Gupta oversaw investigations into the police departments in Ferguson, Missouri after the shooting death of Michael Brown. She similarly investigated the Baltimore Police Department's pattern and practice of harassing African American residents. In 2017, she was named President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, a coalition of more than 230 national organizations working towards a more open and just society. Since being confirmed, Associate Attorney General Gupta has continued her efforts to reform policing, including launching the National Law Enforcement Knowledge Lab to better educate police about best practices, protect the right to vote across states throughout the country, and protect the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals, along with so much more. Joining her in, conversa in conversation today is Professor Barbara McQuaid. Professor McQuaid was appointed by President Obama to serve as a U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. As U.S. Attorney, she oversaw cases involving public corruption, terrorism, and civil rights. She is now a professor from practice at the University of Michigan School of Law and a legal analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. It is my pleasure to introduce the Associate Attorney General of the United States, Vanita Gupta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you go number three. One, two, three. I'll sit two. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thank you so much for being here with us, Benita. I am uh, honored to be here. It's great to be in this room. I have to say, the fact that all of you are here at 5.40 p.m. on a Friday afternoon of a three-day weekend means that you all are the diehards. So uh, <laughs> you should give yourselves a, a round of applause, but thank you. <clears throat> This is a great group, and I, I've been here at the conference and really enjoying the um, enthusiasm of this group and the idealism of this group. Uh, and we've had a wonderful time. But I should warn you that yesterday, in that chair, sat Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And I don't want to put any pressure on you, <laughs> Vanita, but when she spoke, she actually got up and walked around the room <laughs> and shook every hand as she simultaneously answered questions. So what do you think? Thanks, I really appreciate that as the opening start. Um, <laughs> there are, are many reasons we look up to Justice uh, Sotomayor. The, I unfortunately cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. So I will be, you'll have to put up with me being on stage for 20 minutes um, uh, here, but I've heard that she does that and I think that is quite lovely. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. In fact, I think more than a handshake, I actually got a soulful squeeze, I think. <laughs> Just I'm sure that all 400 yeah. <laughs> of you believe that you got the soulful I think squeeze. so, yeah. So, 
it was it was really wonderful. But we're really happy um, that you're here. And you know, maybe just to start, if you could tell people what you do as the associate attorney general, and you should know it's a big deal. It is the number three position at the Justice Department. Um, just can you just tell us a little bit about what that job does? Sure. Um, so. The Associate Attorney General um, oversees all of the civil litigating components at the Justice Department, and by that, I mean the Civil Rights Division, the Civil Division, the Tax Division, the Antitrust Division, the Environment and Natural Resources Division, plus all of the grant-making components, um, uh, the, the COPS Office, the Office of Violence Against Women, uh, the Office of Justice Programs, and I always forget I, when you start making me do this, um, and we give, as you all probably know, about $4 billion out to jurisdictions around the country to support justice systems, policing, uh, law enforcement reform, uh, justice reform, a myriad of programs um, all over the country, and so that's really the portfolio of the Associate AG. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> an enormous, an enormous task. Well, um, here at this convention, we have been talking about a lot of big issues. You just heard the tail end of the last one on abortion. But one of the things I think that we've all been talking about that are really uh, concerning to us are the threats to our democracy. You know, so much is being done to weaken election integrity, um, to suppress voting rights, and then, of course, the January 6th insurrection. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the work that the Department of Justice is doing to protect our democracy. Sure. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, and the Attorney General hasn't sugarcoated it, that we are in a time of peril for our democracy. There are fundamental norms that are being challenged every day. Uh, and while I don't oversee the January 6th prosecutions, it does bear mentioning, because the hearings are going on now, that um, as the AG has said, the January 6th uh, was really an unprecedented attack on the seat of our democracy. and that the Justice Department has got the largest investigation we've ever had into the events that took place that day. And uh, the Attorney General has been really clear that the Justice Department remains committed to holding all uh, of the January 6 perpetrators at any level accountable under the law, whether they were present that day or are criminally, uh, otherwise criminally responsible for what happened. Um, and we're gonna follow the facts where they lead. And so, um, so, you know, of course, that is occupying a lot of the uh, focus uh, uh, right now, understandably so, but there is so much more work that the department does every day to protect our democracy. And a lot of different parts of the department are involved. Uh, I think all of you are quite familiar with the work of the voting section in the Civil Rights Division, which is forces, does all of our civil enforcement, enforcing our federal voting rights laws. Um, and our tools took a serious hit uh, with the Shelby County decision in 2013 that really gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act um, and took away our preclearance tool, which allowed us to stop racially discriminatory laws in local and state jurisdictions before they would ever be to, uh, enact, uh, kind of go into effect in jurisdictions that had histories of racial discrimination in voting. But we are continuing to evaluate and, and enforce the law wherever we um, find violations of our voting rights law. We've challenged statewide laws in Georgia and Texas, for example. We've had a number of um, matters in litigation to challenge redistricting plans where we have found that they violate the voting rights law. But we also have criminal laws that both the criminal division um, uh, that the criminal division public integrity section deals with um, looking at voter intimidation, um, looking at voter suppression that may be violations of criminal criminal law, and um, and then the national security division that is always looking out for uh, malign interference by um, uh, actions sponsored by foreign governments in our uh, that threaten our elections, and then every U.S. attorney's office and Barb, you know this, having been a U.S. attorney, has a district election officer that is working constantly with the FBI in our voting section um, to ensure that we can protect against election crimes. On the day of election, we're gonna send out monitors um, to specific jurisdictions around the country really to ensure that we are able to understand what's happening and if there needs to be future enforcement based on what we see, um, we will be out there in full force. And so, you know, these are some of the things we do with this is the enforcement. This past year, um, and actually the last two years, we, in, the, in light of some of the um, post-election audits that were taking place around the country, we issued guidance about those. We have been 
uh, looking to ensure um, registration of people that may be in federal custody. We're looking at all kinds of creative ways to promote uh, voting and to make sure that despite all of the challenges and the laws that are getting enacted around the country that may seek to suppress voting, that the Justice Department is out as, as, as much as we can on a whole bunch of issues. And I would just wanna say we've also been dealing, as you know, with a surge in threats against election administrators and workers. And the Deputy Attorney General and Attorney General launched a task force um, really to uh, be able, we did a meeting recently with over a thousand election workers to really understand the nature of these threats. They have been, they're unacceptable. These are people who often are volunteers um, working uh, to protect our, our elections who are receiving death threats or, um, and the like. And so, we just yesterday announced a plea um, uh, involving a, a Nebraska man who had threatened a senior Colorado election official uh, and he's now facing up to two years in prison, but it is in part to send a message that this type of behavior is unacceptable and it corrodes our democracy. So these are some of the ways in which we are hard at work. There are other parts of the erosion of our democracy that we don't have tools for uh, and we had been hoping Congress would restore the heart of the Voting Rights Act but we're also dealing with intense polarization, which also undermines our democracy. And that is work that I think each of us have a role to play in our own communities to, to fight that. And, um, uh, and so I think this is really an all hands on deck moment for our democracy. We shouldn't take it for granted. Um, there's nothing inevitable about our system. Uh, it is going to take all of us in this room. I believe that's probably why all of you are here at 5.45 uh, uh, on Friday, because you care about democracy, you care about our country, um, but it's gonna take all of us really understanding the role that we have to play in, in keeping the system of ours. I appreciate that and all, especially your talk about looking forward, about doing what we can to protect elections going forward. But I also did happen to notice, you talked about something that happened in the past, January 6th, and I know the Department of Justice has very stringent rules about what you can and cannot say publicly. So I know you can't say it, but I'll just underscore some words that she said. She said, I think she said, they would hold accountable anyone at any level, whether they were president at the Capitol or not on January 6th. Did I hear that right? You heard that right. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> let's turn to policing because uh, that is certainly another fraught issue at this moment. And I know when we were in the Obama administration together, you came around just at the time that the Ferguson uh, shooting occurred, and you did some really important work there to lead that Ferguson investigation that led to a lot of changes in Ferguson and elsewhere uh, on fines and fees and other kinds of things. And now, of course, we're still dealing with the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. Um, and simultaneously, we were talking about this at lunch today, we're also seeing this big spike in violent crime. So there are multiple factors going on that the Justice Department has to think about. What do you think that police reform work looks like right now? And is there tension between addressing violent crime and police reform? Yeah, I think it is a um, gross misnomer to think that it's, these are dichotomies. I don't yeah. think that we can fight violent crime if there's uh, in a, the absence of police community trust. And you need accountability, you need transparency um, in order for people to feel uh, and have police community trust. And so for the Justice Department, the Attorney General kind of identifies the goals of the Justice Department three ways, to defend the rule of law, to um, uh, protect public safety, and to uh, to protect civil rights, and that these are kind of co-equals on the on uh, for the mission of the Justice Department, and I think you know, and and you know this, Barb, from the work that you've done. But for the Justice Department, this work of fighting violent crime has to be hand in hand with police legitimacy in communities that they serve. Um, witnesses aren't going to uh, share information with the police. Victims are not going to report crimes to the police. Um, you, you know, you just, you literally cannot do one without the other. And, and the reality is in how we're kind of tackling this, um, the administration has been a firm supporter of this community violence interruption, really taking community leaders at the local level who have the credibility in their communities to, to engage uh, in, and do the intervention with, in communities where there's higher risk of gun violence. and. Um, and, and to understand police, police reform and the fight against violent crime as hand in hand is something that we take really seriously. 
This room probably is quite well aware of Ferguson, Baltimore, uh, you know, more recently in this administration, we've opened pattern practice investigations into the Phoenix Police Department, Minneapolis, Louisville, um, most recently last week, uh, Louisiana State Police through the Civil Rights Division Pattern Practice Enforcement Arm. It's a really important tool that Congress gave us after uh, the Rodney King beating in, in, by the LAPD in 94. But we right now probably, I think, enforce 15 consent decrees. We're a nation of 18,000 police departments. Most are quite small. Um, and we have to understand that our pattern practice tool, which is kind of the highest profile tool in some ways, is only going to reach a tiny, tiny fraction of police departments. So one of the things that we have really been trying to do is to build out other resources to promote the learnings, you mentioned Ferguson, it was out of that report that we issued that there became a much greater understanding nationwide of how court systems and police departments were using fines and fees literally to fund themselves. So there was like a built-in incentive to engage in arrests and, um, and the like. And that was like one way we started to have a national conversation. We issued guidance, we brought state courts in. We are now, we just launched the Knowledge Lab um, recently that is really aimed at drawing all of the learnings from our consent decrees, but also from our COPS office, which does tons of research, and NIJ and other places, to basically build out and amplify and provide technical assistance and training on all of those learnings for police departments around the country. And I was out in Los Angeles actually launching this, and there were police chiefs from all over the country that were there to, to Basically, and, and I think this resource, frankly, I'm surprised it hasn't existed at the Justice Department before, but could be a game changer for our work with law enforcement. The president also recently announced an executive order that touches on a whole range of data collection issues, transparency. Um, the Justice Department recently amended our use of force standard for federal law enforcement. We've got to practice what we preach as well. We kind of put in what was already being trained, but it didn't exist in policy on the duty to de-escalate, the duty to intervene, the duty to render medical aid. Um, we, the deputy AG last year uh, uh, announced a change in policy on chokeholds and no-knock warrants. And so this is, an, you know, this is a widespread effort. The Justice Department has to practice what we preach, but we also have to be able to reach far more police departments and be able to really build partnerships with law enforcement. I'm seeing leaders all over the country really take this on in serious ways. And I think that's how we're gonna forge forward is using the broad range of these tools. We also, as I said, provide a lot of funding out there to promote best practices. Um, and I think, you know, we, are, we were able in this administration to relaunch a couple of programs that were shut um, in the prior administration, including collaborative reform through the COPS office, and it's that program now that is working on the police review, the review of events of the police response uh, of the horrible, horrific Uvalde school shooting. So being able to have a much broader spectrum of tools, I think, is so important for the work that we do. Well, we're closing in on 6 o'clock. And um, listening to you gives me a lot of hope. And I'd love to give our um, participants here today, whether they're lawyers or students, some you know, things to think about and take with them. Either there's something that gives them hope, you hope, or something that they can do to make a difference in protecting our democracy and leading our country from this dark time into a brighter time. So I'm a lifelong civil rights lawyer, so I have an abundant well of hope. Um, that is the only way in which civil rights lawyers, I think, get up every morning to, um, to do this work. And I am you know, honored to be at the Justice Department just this week. I earlier, um, the Attorney General and I and a few other senior officials went up to Buffalo to announce the charges there and met with the families and um, who, uh, who were, um, uh, who've lost loved ones uh, on that horrific day on May 14th. And, you know, it's when I look them in the eye and see how they are still engaging and um, despite some of the, you know, most traumatic things that could ever happen to people, kind of still believing in this country and in the system, I think uh, every day that despair is a privilege that we should not take up uh, and that it is too easy to think you know what, let, you know, to let cynicism take over and just say, forget it, I'm done, the problems are too intractable, they're too hard. Uh, the reality is this country has been through a lot, uh, uh, slavery, Jim Crow, uh, just to name some, 
And the only thing that has ever made a difference in this country to push through some of the most intractable problems we know has been good people, young people often, good people, and I say young because they are often the least cynical, at least then, um, who are refusing to accept the status quo and who are saying that we have to be our own agents for change, whether it is that we are litigating in the courts, whether it is that we are marching in the streets, whether it is that we are pushing state legislatures, city councils, school boards, Congress, um, that is the only thing that has ever made a difference. And so as hard as these problems are that we are facing today, uh, I ask you to stay hopeful and to continue to do the work and to show up in these types of rooms to build a community that you are every day and to not leave any stone unturned in the effort to protect the most vulnerable among us and to protect our democracy. In the end, In the end, I believe that hope is a discipline. It's a muscle you have to practice every day. You have to be intentional about it. And so in these moments where it can seem like there are so many difficult problems we're facing, just understand that it is all of us, all of you, that are going to be wherever you are, whatever organization you're in, whatever solo practice you're in, whatever you're doing, that we are kind of workers of our democracy and we are the ones who will do what we can to keep it. It is on all of us. And so I just thank you for being here the last two days. I know that you're here because you care. And I ask that you uh, keep remembering that hope is a discipline. Wow. Well, let me say thank you for being here. Thank you for speaking with us. Um, and thank you for the work that you do every day at the Justice Department. I know sometimes it's a slog, but hope is a discipline is a great mantra for all of us to take home with us. So thank you so much. Um, how about a round of applause for our Associate Attorney General of the United States? Standing ovation for you, Matt. That was really terrific.